Live from the Slightly Twisted Deck Bar, it's the Poojee Podcast with Justin Lameen. The Poojee Podcast is proudly sponsored by Cimarron Golf Club, located in Jacksonville, Florida, off County Road 210, just west of St. John's Parkway. Thank you to Strings Sports Brewery, as always, for bringing you these interviews. They do a great job there. It was just there last week for $5 Burgers, as you heard on my Poojee Parlay PGA Tour Picks which, by the way, I hit on the Justin Thomas victory, so that was nice, of course. And also, thank you to Cimarron. Speaking of golf, they do a great job there at Cimarron Golf Club on County Road 210. A cool episode for you today. Not doing the sports report before this episode. A quick sports report in basketball world. Jonathan Isaac tears his ACL out for the season. I know one of our panel members is not going to be too happy about that. NHL playoff qualifying rounds are officially underway. The Lightning just won in a shootout against Washington. Washington kind of manhandled them the last two periods of the game. Uh, so it was interesting to see Lightning, uh, the Lightning win in the shootout there. Vegas and Dallas are currently playing, and Montreal pulled off the big upset against uh, the Penguins yesterday. So got to see what happens in game two. But here we are one day away from one of the biggest moments of this summer, considering quarantine. And I know this is a sports podcast, but within sports, you have a lot of competition, and that's what we're here to talk about today. One of the greatest reality TV show competitions ever to be created, uh, of course, by CBS. And, and we had our Survivor finale. You're going to recognize some of these faces here. Um, you're going to recognize uh, our Miami expert down there with the Heat and the Dolphins, always talking Miami sports. So uh, without further ado, I do want to welcome in the panel uh, for Big Brother. We're doing our Big Brother 22 uh, preview show. Excited for a uh, Wednesday. So I have gone grid view with everyone. Uh, so you can see everyone. I am going to start this off real quick as I am extremely excited and I don't really know where my head's at for season 22. Um, I know we have a lot of returning guests or at least that's what the expectations are. But I want to ask you guys and if you want to start with Jacob, uh, just kind of briefly, what are your expectations for this premiere? Uh, it's going to be a truly live premiere, right, for the first time. Not too sure who the contestants are yet. I'm sure only a handful of people know who they are. But what are your expectations and uh, where are your excitement levels? Excitement levels through the roof. I love Big Brother. You know, Survivor ended a while ago. I've needed something since then. Expectations, it's kind of, it's kind of going to be weird because normally we know who we're going to have going in. So it's probably exciting to find out tonight officially. I know there's rumors that have been going around. Um, it will be weird because I'm sure when they go in, no live audience. So it might be a little off. But I think it'll just be exciting to see who they brought back and um, who, who's going to be going head-to-head -head this season. Zach, what about you? Where's your head at, man? So, um, yeah, this season I'm excited for it. Definitely we've been missing it. Uh, usually it starts up late June. Um, so it's great to have Big Brother back. Uh, this is going to be different. Um, all-star season I mean Survivor we had uh, spoke about that they pulled it off they did a great job with it I love these all-star things I love bringing on uh, former players in so it's gonna be real cool I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned all-stars there too we're gonna get to that in just a second Nick Brown what about you man what do you got to say you know man it's it's weird last summer I like got all access and I started doing like the watching live feeds and I was so hooked to it so I was still looking forward to that summer, this, for that this summer, and I uh, was thinking I wasn't going to get it. So I'm happy that it's happening. So my excitement level is very high for that. And I'm also interested about to see, like, how the COVID is really going to play into, like, all of this. Like, how they're – obviously going to be, you know, no audience, but, you know, how they're going to – the game's going to be set up. Are they, you know, the people around it, how is it all going to affect it? And it's just what I'm interested in seeing. So that's what I'm excited about. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that about COVID. I think in one of the uh, overseas versions of the show, there was actually a viral clip back in February or March that they had to tell the house guests that COVID was starting. And here we are in August, uh, and now we're starting up in the U.S. with, uh, with Big Brother. So, uh, Tichi, finally, what about you, man? Oh, yeah, man, I have expectations are through the roof for this season. I mean, just how Zach just mentioned, uh, Survivor just had their all-star-esque season, and it was the best season of all time. So I'm curious to see what kind of fire token twist that Big Brother is going to throw in here because they're the king of twists. So uh, my expectations are through the roof that they'll, they'll absolutely nail this season. 
So obviously a lot of excitement. I'll cut it back down to just the uh, speaker view on here. And I want to cut over to, uh, to Nick Brown. Um, some, some news has circulated within the Big Brother world over the last few weeks that there's been some pregame discussions between members or potential contestants. Uh, what's your view on that? Do you have any problem with the contestants talking pregame? Is that a part of the game? Is there a, is there a period of time beforehand? What's your thoughts on that? I really don't see a problem with it. Like, to an extent, there's a problem with it. Like, if you're really going to go out there and be like, okay, guys, we're going to do this. We're going to get this person out first, this person out first, and second and third. Then, like, that's, that's a little bit too much. But if you're going out there and you're like, yo, we're, like, I know you were boys. Like, outside of the house, like, after the game's over, we became friends. Obviously, there are going to be alliances like that. You know, like, this, this is a family. This big brother people, you know, to be honest, I work at Universal, and I've seen some of them together at the park. So I know that if they're in the house together, they're going to work together. So I don't see a problem in that aspect. But if we're specifically talking like targeting people like, oh, we're going to go for you, go for you, then maybe maybe that, I think, would be would draw the line for me, I think. Uh, uh, to add to Nick's point, too, um, I was just going to say one thing about it, though, that's that's going to be great. This game is one of those things that it's everything is always changing. So when when I'm. I always thought like game plans and everything like that was a smart way to go into the house. But I feel like it's so difficult to keep the, any game plan you go into the house with just cause like teach, you mentioned also earlier, uh, all the twists and everything that this show throws at people. It's just going to be really interesting to see if people's plans outside of the house stay the same, especially with them playing already once. Yeah, that's what uh, what a lot of people say about boxing. It's similar to Big Brother. You know, everyone goes into the fight with a plan until they get hit in the face. And you show up to Big Brother and everyone has a plan until the game starts to be played. And then no one knows what's going to happen, which is kind of what makes it exciting. And I know that, uh, Zach, you mentioned this in your expectations about the All-Star season. Uh, Teach, I want to jump to you real quick. Uh, do you prefer these All-Star seasons where they bring back a full slate of returning players or maybe a few? Or would you prefer it to be 100% new personalities on the show? If, if there's going to be a problem with people contacting people before the show because they kind of know who's who already, then yes, I would say 100%, let's get the new people in. But otherwise, who can always just say no to an all-star season? All-stars are always – you always got to get the right all-stars. If you, don't, if you don't get the right players, then it's not worth it. But regardless, I'm still excited no matter who's going to be here. And, and now, Jacob, I want to jump over to you real quick. Same question for you, but briefly, I remember when we were in college, you got me into Big Brother by saying, go watch season seven, which was the first all-star season, and I'm pretty sure the last all-star season that Big Brother's done, so they were due for one anyway. Uh, and I fell in love with it in that, epi or in that season, season seven, with uh, Boogie and Dr. Will and, and all those good guys. I think Chick and George might have been in there, if I'm not mistaken, but um, what, what are your thoughts? All-stars, returning cast, or just 100% new players? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Dr. Will and Boogie, chill town all the way. Um, no, I, I kind of agree with, with Tichi. I think there's a time and a place for it. I love new players. Um, and I think if you're going to do returning players, it's best to just do all returning players. Um, season seven was arguably one of the best seasons um, because of that. It was, it was a cutthroat season everyone had played before. Um, so if you're going to have returning people, I think it's best that they're all returning. So it's not just like an immediate target, you know, someone coming in and, oh, we haven't played and he has. So let's just go after him. But I'm all for the all-star seasons, like TG said. Why not get the, the best players and your favorite players to go um, to go back in and, and see who can win? And like TG mentioned about Survivor, they had the all-star season just finish up back in May, which we did the finale uh, show for uh, on the Puji podcast. And it was arguably the best season in survivor history. And I've been watching for a long time and thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I liked the blend of different gameplay uh, from past players, current players, just to kind of blended the, the lines nicely there. Um, but, but different ways to play the game, right? There's, there's so many ways. And, and like Zach mentioned, you can go into it with a plan. Uh, but I do want to talk real quick to, to Nick. Uh, part of the game is showmances and, What's your take on showmances? Is that a good form of alignment with uh, or, or alliance building? What are your thoughts on showmances? First way to put a humongous target on your back. That's my view on showmances. Now, whether or not that target works for you, that's a way to play the game. Showmances make it all the way to the end. So, like, 
with the target on the back. That's what's crazy to me. So showmances, I don't really have a, a yes or no to them because the showmances that make it to the final three and then, you know, one of them gets out, but they made it to final three. Some showmances are shot out right at the beginning. But the funny part is that the whole entire season, you, they're like, let's get them out. They're showmance. Or let's not get them out. They're showmance. So they're always talked about. So if you want to be talked about, get in the showmance. Whether or not it gets you far or not, it just depends on how you play. I don't even know. And I, I think it's a strategic play where if you're emotionally invested in the showmance, it can sometimes work against you. Whereas if you're using it as a part of your game and then you can flip on your showmance immediately, it can sometimes benefit you in the long run uh, being able to flip. But Tichi, what say you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd go back to where Nick just said. I mean, people would always say, oh, do we vote out the showmance now or later? But people got to remember showmance is their two votes. And the more that they stay longer and longer, votes can add up. So showmances, you know, as long as there's a time and place for them, they're fine. But other than that, you know, I don't really care for them, to be honest. I really wish they didn't have any showmances because they're all end up, you know, not making it last. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely always interesting to see. And I just switched back to grid view, mind you. But uh, it's always interesting to see what happens uh, after the show with those showmances, right? And people are always keeping up to date. And we've seen some pan out. We've seen some fizzle out. So it's interesting. But showmances is one way to play the game. And uh, we'll go full panel again. What is the best strategy, in your opinion? And this is open-ended. Best strategy to win the game? And then couple that with what strategy would you approach the game with to best ensure your victory. Jacob, we'll start with you again. Um, so some of my favorite players ever, they've always been puppet masters. That's a tough thing to do. And I think the way that I would describe the way you need to play in today's game, in my eyes, is I would say you need to be a likable influencer. So you don't want to be someone that is just like floating along and going with everybody. You want to influence what people are doing and you want to think what's best for you, but explain it in a way that also sounds good to them. So that way you're taking care of your agenda, but also not stepping on toes and making them think they're doing what's best for them. Because in today's game, everyone's worried about journey management. By the time you get to the end, you don't want to have backstab people to get your way there, even though I think that's, that's for Juicy TV. Um, you want to make sure by the time you get to the end, you have people voting for you. Zach, we'll go with you next. Yeah, so, um, I mean, like I said earlier, it's so difficult to go in with a plan. But my, if I was going in there, I'm probably seeing myself as somebody that would try to be going for the competition wins. I would try – I think I would not be the, a leader, though. I wouldn't be the one – leading everything I think I'd be like a, a second man third man but I would also walk around the house like just trying to be cool with everybody in the house um looking out for people trying to be as nice as possible because I do think we've seen in the past few seasons that like ability like that helps you a lot at the end when you're trying to get those votes there's been people that I know some of the guys on the panel have thought that other people should have won in some seasons but they kind of did some backstabbing on the way, and you know, you know when you when you tell somebody, "Hey, you're coming with me," and you you might win fifty thousand dollars, and then you turn and you turn on them, that kind of hurts. So, I don't know. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of ways you can approach it, and jury management, like it or not, has definitely become a part of the game. Uh, in both this and Survivor, we've seen a lot of deserving players lose games because jury management wasn't their strong suit. Um, but anyway, Tichi, what do you got to say about it, man? Um, well, actually, with jury management, that's a perfect point. As my ideal game, I would love to have said I would like to play like Paul, but, you know, he came in second place twice now because of poor jury management. But if I had an ideal, I guess, strategy, it, it does pain me to say this. I would play how the winner, I think, two or three years ago, Steve, won. He made no one enemy, just kind of slithered to the end and kind of, People hated the guy he was going up against and just won. So that's how I would play. I'd play how Steve, uh, you know, two or three years ago he won it. That's how I'd play. Yeah, realistically, you just have to be more likable than the guy sitting next to you. And, and that would typically, or girl, excuse me, sitting next to you. And that typically would uh, get you that win. Uh, unless, of course, the jury's able to put aside their bitterness in some cases. We don't always see that happen. But uh, sometimes we see 
the people on the wrong end of a blind side be the best advocate for that player at the end of the show. So uh, you never really know what to expect. Nick Brown, what do you got to say about it? So there's two things that both of you just said that apply to one player that I'm talking thinking of. Casey, she's sociable. She was liked. And there was, she didn't have enemies going throughout this whole entire season. Everyone loved her, right? Let's go. Like she had a catchphrase. People like, and the thing is, she won competitions. And competitions she won, she won vetoes and like didn't use them or like pulled off an alliance. That was all circumstances that worked out where it was never like a, a cutthroat decision that she ended up having to make, which again went into her being liked. Um, so if you go in and be liked and can make moves without stabbing people in the back, but again, that it's hard to like say you're going to do that. Um, but then also she went up against somebody that wasn't liked. So the other, the, like how you were saying that, um, someone else was saying that. Um, sorry if that cut off. Um, but yeah, he, she went up against Tyler. Like he was liked, but he promised alliances to everybody. And then everybody went into the jury and pr like all found out, started talking. Oh, wow. He promised you. He promised you. He promised you. He promised you. Well, he promised me. Well, fuck him. Or, you know, excuse me. I'm sorry for not allowed to curse. But, you know, that's that kind of goes against both things that you guys are saying. So Casey, great person. You know, I like her. Yeah, Casey. Casey was a good one to watch. And, and last year's winner, Jackson Mickey, um, you know, he won in one of the most controversial finales. It was just a very awkward ending to the show. Uh, wasn't too comfortable watching it. He wasn't comfortable being there. Um, but how can you feel awkward and uncomfortable after winning $500,000? It must be very difficult to feel that way. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing what happens here. I'm going to go back to just speaker view. So thanks, guys, for jumping back in. Tichi, I want you to, uh, to jump on for me briefly. How has the show evolved? I know you've watched it. Um, for a few years now, like you mentioned, has the show evolved as drastically as maybe Survivor has since day one or even since the middle of its existence? Well, for me, it's a completely different experience compared to Survivor. The, the twist that they throw on every, it seems like every two or three weeks, there's a brand new twist that completely shakes off the house that you just, you do not see in Survivor and you've got to be prepared for it. I mean, I remember one of the twists, it just kind of funnily, there was like a twin one year where it was a girl who looked identical and she would come in and out and then they both eventually kind of came in and they were both made it very far close to the end. So um, I would say just very close to the twist. I love how they just evolved with that more and more throughout the years. And I think on that specific twist, I'm pretty sure they got caught because one of the house guests recognized that one of the twins was getting heavier than the other one. And it was just kind of an awkward uh, reveal of the twin twist. Uh, one of my favorites was when uh, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but they had the, uh, the travel destinations all over the house. And uh, you had the opportunity to potentially win advantages by guessing exactly what the destinations were. That was one of mine. But you're right. I mean, the slogan, the slogan is expect the unexpected. And that's exactly what it is when you go into it is if you expect anything, you're probably wrong. So uh, just kind of going in with an open mind, open strategy. Uh, but, but Jacob, for you, I know you've watched for a long time. Like I mentioned, you kind of getting me into the show. Uh, how has the show evolved in your eyes? Has it evolved for the better, for the worse? What are your thoughts? Well, just to speak on the actual like setup of the game, what I find interesting that maybe not everybody knows, depending on when you watched, if you go back to season two, um, that's one of the first earliest episodes or seasons I've watched. They didn't even have veto yet. So we're talking about a game that up until now, it's been changing drastically that year in and year out, we know it as it is now. But HOH was introduced in season two. Vito was introduced in three. They didn't do the jury like they do now until about three or four. Um, and by the time they got to seven, I think a lot of the, the current gameplay um, set up, just the, the format of the game is what it is today. Um, but like someone said, jury management, I would say today's game has evolved where you can't just steamroll your way through anymore. You used to be able to be the ultimate puppet master and just burn everybody getting your way to the end. And now it's really the social game has gone a lot more like on importance. It's a lot more important now than just strategic. And um, I, I love I love when people can control the house, but it's changed where you have to make sure you're you're taking care of everybody in the house as well and socially accepted. 
Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's, it's definitely evolved to those different standpoints. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, having to adapt to the game, you might watch one season and, and, you know, like Zach, I know really wants to be on the show has applied often and, and what might work today might not work in five years and, and what works today didn't work five years ago. So it's constantly changing just based on more knowledge from the contestants going into it. And the cliche is, Oh, I'm, I've been a super fan since day one. And, like, that's what a lot of people say. But even though you're a super fan, you have to continue to adapt with the game. Tichi, I want to swing it over to you real quick. Um, some, some of the competitions, obviously, um, in other shows as well, are all over the board. Some of them are mental competitions, physical competitions. Uh, what, what are some of your favorite types of competitions in, in Big Brother? What do you think really kind of stands out to you? Well, overall, a lot of the Big Brother competitions are just, just straight up just endurance competition just stand there on a pole or something like that so those are kind of fun but overall I, I know they always have the yearly competitions that they have like this kind of scrabble competition where you build the longest words that you have but my personal favorite has got to be where the contestants get to hide something in the house and all the other contestants get to completely destroy the house to find those objects just an all-time favorite for myself yeah, that one, that one's a ton of fun, and, and it's the hide-and-seek with the veto, uh, which I'm definitely looking forward to this year. And also, OTEV, uh, the Battle of OTEV is a great one, which I just saw a report that that's going to be back this season. So I'm definitely excited about that. Zach, any uh, particular competitions stand out to you or, or your style of competition that you prefer? Well, you named it right there. I mean, OTEV for sure – a hundred percent. I have, I have a bucket list of things. If, if I ever get into the big brother house, my number, number one thing is get past week one. I don't want to embarrass myself. Second thing, I got a bunch of other things. Try to win America's favorite. But one of those things is getting to play OTEV. That is the coolest competition. I think I would be, it's luck, but it's also skill. You got to be athletic. You got to be fast. I wouldn't be good at those endurance comps like that teach you mentioned where you got to stand up on a pole or something for uh, for sometimes hours at a time. Wouldn't be good at those. The hide the hiding one. I love that competition too. But Otev by far has got to be my be my favorite one. It's definitely a good one. And Zach, while I have you here, want to get into some of the past players. And for you specifically, is there a player that comes to mind uh, that maybe is is an underrated player in Big Brother history, or one that maybe doesn't get enough credit or as much credit as they deserve? Okay, yeah, so um, I think first off, last year, Mickey was could go down as a top player. He was very uh, – he was just a competitive beast, and he ended up winning the whole thing. He has the whole downfall about what he would say – what he was caught saying and stuff during the show. But actually, the person that I think is probably one of the most underrated people and don't get spoken about is uh, Nicole. She played two seasons. She did pretty well her season and then won her second season. So to go on the second time and win that second time was even – it's even more impressive. People know that you're, you, you've been on the show. They're, they want to get you out first off because you've done it before. Second, they know your style of play. So it's – her, I think, is super underrated and isn't spoken about. Yeah, and I think a lot of times that coat riding mentality or type gameplay is sometimes, uh, you know, confused. Uh, it's really a strategic play to a certain extent. If, if, like Jacob said, you're kind of making the moves or you're influencing the moves on the back end, uh, but you always kind of have a shield in front of you with a bigger target. Um, you know, like I said, where you just have to be more likable with the guy sitting next to you. In this case, you just have to have one less vote than the person that you're up against. So it's that same mentality of having that shield and, and knowing sometimes with those floaters that we've seen make it deep in the game, that that's going to be someone easy to sway their vote and also easy to, uh, to kind of vote out if you ever need just someone to vote out. So did you have something else, Zach? Uh, could I, yeah, could I add one thing to that is also you mentioned showmances before. She was also in a showmance her first year and a showmance the second year, and she ended up winning. Mickey was in a showmance. He's won. So the showmances as of late, they've pulled it off. Even even the twin twist, uh, the one girl was Liz. She was a twin with Julia, but Liz was also in a showmance with Austin that year, and she lost in the finals. But 
it shows that you, you could pull off the showman's for sure. There's been plenty of people in one that have pulled it off, and it is an extra vote usually. If, they, if you guys make it to the jury, you're usually getting an extra vote there. So always nice. For sure. And some of those people in those showmances, like you mentioned, Mickey might go down as one of the top players of all time. But, Jacob, I want to swing it over to you real quick, someone that's watched it for a very long time. Uh, maybe your top two, maybe three all-time players in Big Brother history. This could be your favorite, best strategy, best winners. Uh, who you got? Well, if you know me and, and, and you know I love the strategic puppet master style of games, people know that my favorite player is Will Kirby from season two and seven. And then I would say Dan Giesling from season 10. And he then coached on 14 and played. And I think, I think those two will pretty much set the standard for what, you know, a great strategic big brother player is. Cause he was playing in season two when there was no real set game yet. And he, he actively went out to say like, you know, I'm the target, you know, people don't like me, take me to the end. I'm not going to win any competitions. He threw competitions all the time because he didn't want to be that threat. He told people, you know, I'm going to backstab you. I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to do all these things. And they still didn't get rid of him. He hopped on the block so many times, talked his way out. Like I said, season two, they had no veto yet. So when he was nominated, which was a, a good handful of times, he never went home despite no veto. Um, moving over to Dan. Dan is probably the closest I've seen to Will, at least in my opinion, with just his ability to, like, to talk with people and influence them. He's a, he's a football coach, so he uses that kind of style of, of speaking to people and uplifting them, um, but then he backstabs you. And, you know, that's a very um, tough way to go in this day and age. But what's crazy about Dan is he won his first season, and then he came back as a coach and almost won his second season. I think he's one of – if he's not the only one, He's one of the very few people to ever make it to final two in the two seasons they've played. Um, he had Dan's funeral. If you don't know what that is, either go watch season 14 or Google that because it's one of the greatest moves I think I've ever seen and will see on this game. Um, and then, and just going back to Will, he nearly won all stars. The only reason he didn't him, him and Boogie were taking their showmances. We were talking about showmances to the final and, and, you know, using them to, to take their agenda, agenda to the end until they got wind of it. But he honestly almost won the All-Star season. I think, I think it's, it's one and two easy. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has to say an, another name, but I think Derek from a few years ago is probably the closest I've seen yet and doing it in a way that's not backstabbing and actually a likable way of playing. Yeah, it seems like, uh, it seems like Will Kirby and, as you mentioned, Dan – and now Derek are, are up there in that MJ LeBron debate of best of all time. Is it, is it an era thing? Is it a different style of game now? Is it, what is it who played the more perfect game, but at the end of the day, they all won. Uh, and I guess that's what ultimately matters uh, in the show. Tichi, do you have a player that sticks out to you? Yeah, just to be quick. I, I like I said, my favorite player is Paul the last couple of few seasons, got second place twice. And since my boy Zach is wearing the pink hat, got to mention Zach Rance from a few years ago. So got to see Zach Rance as well. <laughs> yeah, Zach Rance was one of the best, had a great personality in the show, the signature pink hat. Uh, so that was always great to see him with, with that hat on. And Zach, what about you, man? What do you got? Um, for favorite player of all time, I mean, recently, definitely Derek, I think just I thought he played such a flawless game nobody voted him out or nobody even he didn't get one vote against him the whole season I don't think he was even um put on the block at any point so he played a flawless game but I had my favorites from like way before I think it was Big Brother 12 uh Jeff and Jordan uh they were a showman they've they got two kids now married they met each other on the show they're my two of my favorites so I love those two yeah, those are some some really good players, obviously, from, from past seasons. Uh, I do want to swing it over to Tichi real quick for the final question. Um, Tichi, I know you're a big Survivor fan. I know you're a big Big Brother fan. Uh, if there was one show that you think you'd have a better chance of winning, which one would it be? And second part to that, Julie Chen Moonves or Jeff Probst as a host? Who would you rather see on the other show? 
Uh, I got to stay true, man. I got to stay survivor and I got to stay Jeff Probst, man. I got to love that combo. So yeah, I got to keep those two. Sorry. Jacob, what about you, man? You know, I've grown up watching Big Brother. That was always my favorite show. But recently, Survivor's been killing it. And I, I've actually had an interest to be on that show. I think the house, the house will make you go crazy. Um, but Survivor will be a fun, a fun thing to go travel and have Jeff Probst yelling at you while you're trying to, you know, lift heavy things or run over obstacles you haven't eaten in like 20 days. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think Julie's a great host. Um, but I do love Jeff Probst. But, I mean, how can, you go, how can you go wrong with Julie Chen, right? You know, funny story about Jeff, and I think I mentioned this on the finale for, or the Survivor finale show. He was in the running with the host for Amazing Race, and whoever won that competition uh, between the two of them would get Survivor, and the other one would get uh, Amazing Race. So it was between those two for those two shows. Julie Chen seemed to have – uh, big brother in the bag, but happy to see Jeff landed on Survivor. Zach, what do you got to say, man? Oh, no, I was just um, definitely to answer the first question. Uh, I've mentioned this before to you guys, uh, but yeah, I would probably be a better big brother player than Survivor because I just don't see myself have, living outside for 30 plus days and doing well with that with no food. Um, that's not me. So um, but yeah, actually, as big of a big brother fan I am, Jeff Probst is just the man. I feel like everybody knows him. He's just this, it would just be cool to see him uh, in the big brother house and even cool to see Julie out there and see how they both handle the different dynamics and situations. For sure. No. And I, I appreciate that feedback, of course, definitely some good stuff and it would be interesting to see how Julie handled the wilderness, but at the same time would be interesting to see how Jeff Probst handled not being able to talk gameplay with some of these contestants, because I think that's one of the biggest differences. And, and Jacob, you mentioned this earlier today to me that Julie is more of a narrator of the game, whereas Jeff is more of a operator of the game where he kind of continues the game, helps it move along. Julie kind of narrates it. Uh, doesn't really mention gameplay all that much, but guys, I appreciate you being here on this. Uh, I'm going to finish up right here with my Puji parlay picks presented by Shores Pub Mandarin following that fantastic Big Brother preview show. Uh, we do have some exciting sports coming up this week. PGA Championship, first major of the PGA Tour golf season uh, out in San Francisco. So be prepared for some evening golf here on the East Coast. See if Justin Thomas can uh, follow up that victory this past Sunday with a strong performance this coming weekend. Or if Brooks Kepka can retain the PGA Championship title, uh, which I know is Jacob's favorite golfer. Um, because he did something for Jacob in fantasy football. So uh, the, Jacob loves the Kepka with NASCAR coming up as well. We have a dual weekend similar to Pocono from a few weeks ago, uh, Saturday and Sunday races. Definitely looking forward to that. But since I still have you guys here, I want to pull Tichi in really quickly. Who is your number one guy for the PGA championship? Are you going with uh, Tiger? Uh, I don't know. I got to go with the hot hand, Justin Thomas again, man, back to back. He's got the hot hand. He's I good. Cannot I can't blame you there. That's a great pick. I think uh, I think he's got a lot of potential this week. He's playing very well. Uh, we also got hockey action going on right now, NBA action going on right now. I may need to get with Zach for some of that uh, basketball action. Zach, real quick while I have you on here, who's your pick for the finals after what you've seen in these first three games out of the East and West? Oh, man. So after what I've seen from the future, yeah, it's still early to tell, but – I'm going to go with – out of the East, still going to go with Milwaukee. Um, Giannis is just a complete beast. And then in the West, I'm probably going to end up switching my pick. I was Lakers all the way, but I think it's going to be the Clippers. I mean, those guys are just – they're loaded. That team is so loaded, so stacked. And uh, don't sleep on to, uh, Toronto because Toronto out in the East, too, they are playing really well together. They just pulled off a win against the uh, my Miami Heat, but – they're looking good, so. We're going to see what happens there in NBA. I've been watching some of the games, like I promised you, Zach, on the Back to Basketball episode, and unfortunately with Isaac's injury yesterday, I think I might be some bad luck for the Magic, so uh, maybe time for me to pick another team and maybe get another player injured. Jacob, briefly, real quick, uh, I'm not sure if you've watched any of the Chicago Cubs. I know that's your baseball team. Uh, what, what are you thinking from them uh, moving forward in the NL, uh, NL Central? Excuse me, I always get those confused. Uh, strong division, 
a lot of COVID happening with the St. Louis Cardinals right now. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Cubs? Do you think they make a run for it in this 60 game season for the World Series? I mean, they're killing it right now. I think they're seven and two at the top of the top of the league. Um, we do have, um, I think maybe Friday, we had a, a series against the Cardinals. So I'm not really sure how that's going to play out. Like how soon um, they'd be ready to play if they if they do. But the Cubs are killing it. And what it really comes down to right now is their pitching. Their their starting pitching is is playing out of their mind. Our bullpen is awful, but the starting pitching has put us in great positions to win. And our offense has always been good. If the bullpen and maybe specifically like Craig Kimbrell, who's our closer, can t- turn things around, I think we might have a legit shot this year. Um, with the players that we have, it's kind of like any, any year could be the year, and it's kind of dependent on the pitching right now. And Kimbrell uh, coming out of the bullpen almost blew a six-run lead a few weeks, a few nights ago against the Reds. That was a close one, but I had Lester in my FanDuel lineup yesterday, and that won me some money, so that was happy. But I was happy about that. But anyways, guys, Poojie Parlay picks presented by Shores Pub Mandarin. Can't wait for them to get back open once this COVID stuff passes. Hopefully soon we will see what happens there. And hopefully see all of you guys soon down at UCF for some football games here in a few weeks. If we can get fans in there, if we can do some tailgating, makeshift tailgating, who knows. But thanks again for being here. Uh, We'll have to get together for more Big Brother uh, recap shows every week or so uh, just to kind of keep people up to date with what's happening. So thanks again, guys. Appreciate it, Justin. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Expect the unexpected. (laughs) All right, guys. Be sure to follow our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other podcast streaming services, as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out unique video elements for each interview.